affectionately known as the ear, um, which is sort of appropriately named because currently it's an iPod Touch with an app on it that records snippets of ambient sounds as people go about their normal daily lives. So, for example, it would record 30 seconds of sound every 12 minutes, um, and that would yield about 5% of participants' waking day. So this way we get uh, an idea of what life is like and what conversations are like as participants live their normal lives. Um, and so you can see here, um, well, maybe not so well, <laughs> but um, in that yellow box that I've highlighted there, um, basically we just put the iPod Touch in a carrying case that participants wear on their waistline. Um, and here we have a little triangle warning signs to alert uh, bystanders of the potential to be recorded. Um, I have now modified this for California. Um, their laws are a little bit different from Arizona, where I previously was. Um, and so now I don't have an updated photo. I haven't made my RAs pose for a picture yet. Um, but what it will be is the same uh, device in case with a button. Uh, maybe some, some of you have seen Joe's. Uh, he's using them already. That says um, this conversation may be recorded. Um, so it's just a little bit more visible. And it gives bystanders the chance to know that they might be recorded. Um, I should mention also that um, we give our participants the chance to listen to and delete any sound files that they don't want us to have on record. Um, and this would include if a bystander um, noticed the device or the participant told them about the device and they weren't comfortable with us having files on which they were captured, um, the participant then could delete those files as well. So. Um, 30 seconds every 12 minutes here, um, that yields about 85 sound files per day, just for example. Um, and I sort of spoke out of turn here, but um, all of our participants do have the opportunity to review their recordings. So this is kind of a labor-intensive research method, right? So instead of giving people a questionnaire to complete, we're um, recruiting them to wear a recording device, and then we have to process all of that data uh, before we can analyze it. So um, it better have some added benefit to it then, right? Um, so I argue that the ear is optimized to assess um, concrete automatic behaviors that people cannot um, report so easily. Um, also, it facilitates understanding communication processes as they actually unfold in daily life, um, which is a limitation of some of the other methods that uh, people use. So to demonstrate these two benefits here, this is more towards the first point, and then I have a fourth study that I'll tell you about in the end that focuses more on the communication processes. Um, but I have three studies to uh, talk about here that demonstrate the utility of the ear to capture automatic psychosocial processes as they unfold. Um, and so, as I was saying before, um, people can only report those behaviors that they notice and remember in the first place. So a behavior like sighing, which is necessarily a very subtle behavior, um, often goes unnoticed by both the sire and perhaps um, sometimes by the perceivers. So um, this, this behavior, I would argue, is ideally uh, suited for studying it in an observational sort of context. So to study sign, we, uh, we used a sample of rheumatoid arthritis patients. Um, and we did this because rheumatoid arthritis is a chronic inflammatory illness, um, and it's characterized by pain and the, destructive, or in the destruction of peripheral joints. So unfortunately, but not surprisingly, um, depression is a very common comorbidity with rheumatoid arthritis. However, in the literature, it's unclear um, what, whether sign indicates pain um, or more of depressive symptoms. Um, so it's both been construed as a pain behavior among many uh, other sort of behaviors like groaning and grimacing. Um, but it's also been sort of construed as a depression behavior, but no studies have really tried to unpack really what sighing is indicating as people uh, engage in that behavior. And there's research that suggests that the more accurately that partners and other members of someone, someone's support network um, the more accurately that they can perceive um, a patient's depressive symptoms or pain, the better their support is received, the more helpful their support actually is. So it's important to gather evidence then for these indicators of depression and pain as uh, people cope with rheumatoid arthritis. So this is what we set out to study. 
And to do this, we had a small sample. Um, it was 13 married women with rheumatoid arthritis. The mean age was about 56 years. Most of them were white, and the mean time since diagnosis was about seven years. It was a, a chronic illness, too, so that's not atypical. And this is just to give you an idea of the uh, timeline of the procedure. Um, so before they wore the ear at all, they completed measures of psychological adjustment and physical symptoms, both of which I will tell you about in more detail on the next slide. And then they wore the ear for two separate weekends, separated by, the month, by uh, one month. And then four months later, they again completed the adjustment and physical symptoms measures. So for self-reported adjustment, we had two separate measures of uh, depressive symptoms. Both are very widely and commonly used in psychosocial research. Um, and then for physical symptoms, we had participants report their level of pain on a scale of 0 to 100 and their number of flare days. And flare days are days in which um, their symptoms are much, much worse than normal. So these are, um, these are days where they are experiencing more pain, more disability, more stiffness in their joints. So all around very unpleasant uh, experience there. Um, and then from the ear sound files, we coded, we had research assistants listen to them and then code for instances of sighing. Um, and in this sample, we found that about 3.2% of all waking sound files, um, we heard a sigh in those sound files. So you can estimate about 3.2% of the time this sample was sighing. And I, of course, brought an example for you to hear what this sounds like on the ear sound files. Oh, I'm dying. <sighs> yeah, I hurt. <laughs> Okay, so hopefully that, that sigh was clearly heard there. And you can also sense some negative emotion there, right? She's, she's talking about she's dying because she's in pain. Um, and so you can see how ambiguous sometimes that might, signal might be. Yes? Sorry. So this is a percentage of time, so you had like an in and an out for the it, sigh? It was a dichotomous episode? coding system, yes. So um, we just coded presence or absence. So in this case, you do actually miss then, so she sighed more than once in that sound file, um, so you probably heard that. Um, I actually did the analyses another way too with counting, um, and it, it didn't change our results at all, so we kept it with our, our dichotomous. That way it's easier to estimate also um, percentage, of, percentage of time based on our short clips if you just have percentage of sound files in which it occurred. Is that clear? Did that answer? Okay. Any other questions? Okay. What we found was that sighing um, was moderately, but not significantly, right? It's a small sample, um, but not significantly related to the physical symptoms. So here um, in red, you see the pain rating, and um, the dashed line below here is the number of flare days. And so because they weren't significant, we won't say they were unrelated, right, because it was a small sample size, but we did find that they were actually less strongly related to sighing than were our two measures of depression. And so what we conclude, um, preliminarily of course, um, is that sighing may actually be more of an indicator of depression than of pain. Um, and certainly this requires some replication to, um, to say this with more certainty. Um, but we have our first evidence here that perhaps sighing is more of an indicator of depression. So moving on to swearing, it's also a sort of automatic behavior, just like sighing. So we engage in this sometimes without <coughs> consciously deciding our word choice. Um, but it's certainly a less subtle behavior than swearing. Um, and it, it still um, may be very relevant to the uh, coping process. Um, swearing we also thought was very important to study because there's sort of a dearth of psychological research on swearing. Um, only a couple labs uh, working on this and it is a ubiquitous behavior. You find this across uh, various cultures. But to convince you of its ubiquitousness, I brought some headlines here. So in schools, uh, they try to replace words. Here, Angelina Jolie's kids swear in French. 
Um, and across different places and time periods, even species, uh, perhaps of interest to some of you here, um, swearing stirs up this controversy, right? So if it is so controversial, the question remains, why do people swear? Um, and Timothy Jay is, is sort of the swearing expert in psychology, um, and he likens it to using a car horn. So it accentuates emotional communication in a way that other non-taboo words can't. Um, and so, like the car horn, you can beep at a friend um, to say hello, or you can lay on the horn if someone cuts you off. Um, so it's, it's the same signal, but used in, in different ways. Um, and so given the emotional implications of swearing, it's really surprising to me that the role of swearing in the coping context is relatively unknown and unexplored. There was one study, and actually I think since, since the time of uh, this paper that's already published, um, I think this group, Stevens et al., has conducted a couple more follow-up studies um, that sort of corroborate their initial findings. But basically they found <coughs> that swearing can facilitate coping with pain. And so it was this really cool study where they had participants come into the lab and engage in a cold presser task. So they submerged their arm up to about their elbow in ice cold water. Um, and they had them, it was a within subjects design, and so they counterbalanced whether the participants uh, recited neutral words or swear words first. And they found that when participants were reciting swear words as compared to the neutral words, um, they, were with able, they were able to withstand the, um, the cold presser task longer and also reported lower levels of pain. Um, and so this indicates that swearing may be, um, may have some intrapersonal benefits, right? It may help you cope with pain. But certainly, because of swearing's uh, offensive nature, um, Jay has postulated that there may be interpersonal costs to swearing, despite its uh, apparent uh, intrapersonal benefits. So we wanted to dig deeper into this question and examine the role of swearing in the coping context bo with both the intra and interpersonal um, effects. So uh, for this study, I used the same rheumatoid arthritis sample, but here I added 21 uh, married or partnered women with breast cancer. And to just give you an idea of how the samples compare, their age was very similar, and I'd like to also point out again that they were all women. Um, most of the samples were white, and time since diagnosis is really where they differ here, uh, because breast cancer is more of an acute illness and life-threatening illness, whereas Arthritis is more of a chronic illness, so um, the time since diagnosis was longer among the rheumatoid arthritis patients. And I also want to give you an idea of how the timelines of these studies line up here. So this should look familiar from the last study with the rheumatoid arthritis patients. And then here I have the breast cancer sample. So there's a couple things different here is that the breast cancer patients only wore the ear one time. Um, and then there was two months until their follow-up adjustment measures versus the four months with the rheumatoid arthritis sample. However, they did complete the same measures, so um, what I'll be reporting here for my results are um, self-reported emotional support from the COPE questionnaire. So this is a subscale on that questionnaire. And depression using the CESD. And I have residualized up here. When I say change when I'm reporting my results, I mean residualized. So I have the follow-up scores controlling for their time one scores on these me measures. And so in that way, um, we, we take it as a measure of change. And then our ear drive variable, of course, is swearing. Um, and so we use the program called Linguistic Inquiry and Word Count. It's often abbreviated as LOOF. And this basically is a software program where you input your transcripts and then it outputs the percentage of um, words that your particular word category, I'm not describing that very well, um, basically it takes the percentage of total words. So here we have swearing. Um, so this was 0.09% of all words that people used on average um, with quite a range here. Um, and so just to give you some context here, because it seems like a very small percentage, um, uh, first personal um, pronouns are considered a fairly frequent, frequently uh, used type of word, and, and they only occur at about 1%. So things like I, me, my um, are 1% of people's words. So just to give you a little reference point here. 
But I also, of course, want to show you an example um, of how this sounds in uh, these samples. So what I have is a sound file from a rheumatoid arthritis patient who is doing some housework with her husband. Okay, so how do we bust up that tip? Hammer, hammer. That was a little quiet, sorry. But um, basically, just very casual swearing. Um, she's not swearing out of anger. She's not swearing at anyone. Um, and this was actually very common um, of the swearing in this sample. So I went through many, many of these sound files to listen to uh, qualitatively what it sounds like. Um, and I found very few examples of people actually swearing out of anger. So this is a very typical sound file. Uh -huh. Do you think people were deleting maybe those files? <coughs> So that's a good question. So they, um, they weren't. So I should have mentioned um, in these samples, only one participant deleted one sound file. So, so they weren't. Any other questions here? Yeah. How do you control that the women didn't use swearing in their everyday lives before uh, they were recorded? Um, I can't control that. Um, so it's, it's true that they could have been altering their behavior a little bit while they were being recorded. Um, but unfortunately, that's just a limitation that we have to sort of live with in our, in our data. What we do, um, the best met way to sort of assess how typical their weekend was or um, how much they changed their behavior, um, we use this questionnaire for that um, because I think it's the best way we can get at it. At the end of the weekend, we ask them, um, how much did wearing the ear change your behavior? How self-conscious were you of wearing it? How typical was this weekend for you? So we try to, um, to examine it that way. Our scores are typically fairly low for levels of obtrusiveness of the device, and um, they typically report that it was a, a typical weekend for them. Mm -hmm. I, I would just add that, I mean, if people are self-monitoring because they know they're being recorded, that works against your finding any positive confirmation it's, hypothesis. So it's true. So most people would be censoring themselves rather than swearing up, a, you know, swearing a ton. <laughs> swearing up a storm. Any other questions? Okay. All right. So we looked at uh, changes in their reports of emotional support, and we found that swearing was correlated with decreases in their reported emotional support. But, of course, as a social psychologist, I wanted to unpack the social context um, of the swearing. And so what I did was I looked at, um, I had research assistants also code whether the participant was alone or with other people. Um, and so when you tease apart swearing with others present, that's the red line here, we found that that was what was driving the effect rather than swearing alone, which was not a significant relationship. Yes? that they're alone only from the presence of conversation in the 30 second interval? So. Yeah, so you can detect um, actually fairly well whether someone's alone or with others. So conversation would be the, the best way to know that. Um, but you can also sometimes hear background noise of people, um, you know, you can hear someone else engaging in, in some behavior. Um, but yeah, conversation. So if, if particularly if the participant is swearing, um, they're usually having some sort of conversation. Um, and so, and that, well, or swearing alone is like if you stub your toe or something like that. It's qualitatively different when you listen to it, sort of swearing under your breath or, or something like that um, versus in conversation. Does that help? Okay. I should also mention that our, um, I didn't put our intercoder reliability up here for our coding, but our coders typically agree very highly on, on those variables, whether they're alone or not. Yeah? So how are you able to say that it's a coping behavior? Like, how do you know that they're doing this because they have this condition? Like, yeah, that's I, a, I guess. Uh -huh. No, that's a very good question. It's actually one that um, I think is still up for debate, really, um, whether swearing is a coping behavior or not. Um, I actually don't think that people were intentionally swearing to cope, um, but my definition of coping is probably a little more inclusive than, than others. So um, many people define coping as um, intentional efforts to alleviate a particular problem or stressor. Um, 
But I sort of take in the broader context in my definition of coping in that if you're coping with something as major as a chronic or life-threatening illness, that a lot of your behaviors um, probably contribute to even your efforts of coping. So my construal is very broad. Yeah. I just wanted to go back to the alone question. OK. Because, um, Irving Goffman, when he described mm -hmm. those kinds of mutterings, he called them response cries. And his uh, point was that they may not be addressed to someone, but they're said in the presence of, I mean, it, to be heard mm -hmm. by someone. And, and it's, of course, you know, we don't have the, you know, we, we can't tell with the audio, you know, who may be in the, in the visual, the, the, the oral space right. there. But it could be that just by voicing it, it's, it's to be reckoned, if only by maybe the transcriber of the recorder, you know, but, you know, but it's usually, you know, people are, like, they stub their toe and, and they say something and they, it's just meant to be in the sound space mm -hmm. kind of thing. So it's, the, the sociality of it is not the same as, you know, when you're addressing someone, but it's still maybe a social. So, it, I mean, it's it just, it's still I mean, to I be heard when by you separate someone. them out. That makes sure. sense. But, you know, whether or not. It's a not. It's it's just to oneself. It's that's it's a good question, question, and I think it would be really um, interesting to answer that with by combining uh, momentary reports, so they c with the ear data, um, which I certainly plan to do in future projects. Um, so we unfortunately did not have momentary reports of thoughts and feelings, that kind of thing. But we certainly could try to get at people's intention that way, because um, I, I think it's an interesting question. So you, I think. These data are fantastic, and you actually have the data to test. Goffman's account was a, a, a claim. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't a right, proven right. explanation. So right, the, right. the claim was, this is why people are doing this. Mm -hmm. If you have one coder who codes whether the coder thinks someone is there or not, mm -hmm. and you then look at all the instances in which there's muttering, you can see whether Goffman's right or not. Right? And as far as I know, no one ever has. People say that all the time, but no one's ever actually tested mm -hmm. that. And sometimes it's really easy to know if they're alone in that there's a string of sound files, nobody else is there. Um, people make all sorts of noise, whether, you know, no matter how active they are. Um, even some people breathe loudly, you know. <laughs> so, um, so there are some instances where we can say with an absolute certainty this person was alone, alone. Right, and do they, do they mutter with the same frequency? less frequency yeah. or more frequency. Goffman's hypothesis would predict yeah. they mutter with more frequency when you know there's somebody there. I'm going to go home and do that analysis, too, because I have it coded already. So. Yeah, I, yeah, your data before this task. Thank you for the interesting research question. Yeah. Any other questions on this group here? We also analyzed the uh, depression data. So again, changes in depressive symptoms we found were positively related to swearing, which is consistent with the um, negative relationship with emotional support. And of course, again, we unpacked the social context and found that, again, it was swearing in the presence of others and not alone that was related to the increases in depressive symptoms. And so given the uh, social context and, um, and our variables here, we started to think, well, maybe swearing in the presence of others is sort of repelling emotional support. And I know that's a causal statement, and this is correlational data, but we thought we would explore this just to see if we had some evidence for the idea that perhaps swearing is pushing people away at the expense of their psychological adjustment. And so we tested this mediational model using Preacher and Hayes bootstrapping method. And we found, um, again here, these are the relationships that I just told you about. So swearing with others present was related to changes in emotional support and uh, depressive symptoms, and we also found that changes in emotional support were negatively related to depressive symptoms. And we found that based on 5,000 bootstrapping resamplings, um, that there is some medi mediational evidence for the idea that perhaps uh, swearing in the presence of others is repelling emotional support um, at the expense of uh, psychological adjustment. 
And so whereas swearing may perhaps repel support, um, very tentatively perhaps, um, laughing I think actually is also another interesting automatic expressive behavior um, that may have the potential to attract support. And in fact, um, past research has found that um, laughter is a behavioral indicator of um, coping with humor. So in self-reported studies, they find that um, people who endorse coping with humor as a coping strategy, an intentional one, is positively related to psychological adjustment among breast cancer and rheumatoid arthritis patients. Um, there's also work out there that finds that extroverted people tend to laugh more um, and that this might also facilitate people's social interactions. So um, people uh, tend to laugh more when they're in, with friends rather than strangers. Um, and also in um, ecological uh, momentary assessment studies, um, they find evidence that laughter may facilitate the quality of social interactions. So people rate the quality of their interactions higher when they are laughing. So we have this evidence using past methods. Um, most were largely uh, self-reported methods. And so we wanted to know in this naturally occurring uh, context, does laughter predict better adjustment to illness? And also, again, of course, um, does the social context of the laughter matter? Um, and so we used the same sample as the swearing study. And um, again, we had our cope here, but this time we're looking at the subscale coping with humor. Um, and we also looked at the extroversion factor of the big five inventory. And then we assessed social integration using the social networking index. And again, we looked at depression using the CESD. So our, um, our coded laughter from the ear sound files we found that, oh, here I have an ICC. So this is the intercoder agreement for laughter was very high. It was 0.97. Um, and the mean here was 7.5% um, of waking sound files. So even though um, these women are coping with something very serious, like rheumatoid arthritis or breast cancer, we're still seeing that they're laughing in 7.5% of their sound files. And just to break this down in the social context here, um, most of the laughs were in the presence of someone else, so with one person or with multiple people. But there, we did find some laughs alone. I think oftentimes this was when they were watching TV or something like that. And again, I have an example for you. Um, this is a breast cancer patient who's shopping with a friend. And hopefully our volume is okay here. I kind of have the feeling the large will be better for me than the, the medium. Because I don't like them when they show every single wrinkle in my body. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, no. <laughs> it's a little bit infectious there. Um, so we wanted to know if this kind of laughter coded from our sound files was related to better adjustment. And this is just average depression levels here. Um, and we found that laughter did predict lower levels of depression. And when we look at the social context, it's again laughing with someone that is responsible for this relationship. Um, I'm guessing that probably in a larger sample, laughing with multiple people might also have a significant uh, association with depression, but um, in this sample it wasn't significant. And as I was saying before, you know, ear data is pretty intensive to collect and then process. Um, so it better have some added benefit above and beyond those self-reported measures that I told you about before. So here I have our association laughing with someone and controlling for humor, coping, extroversion, and social network. Um, none of them reduced our, uh, significantly reduced our association between coded laughter um, and levels of depression. So what I think this suggests is that there might be something to laughter with other people that isn't captured in our questionnaire. So something that we haven't really thought of to assess or perhaps something that people can't report to us um, when we ask them about it. Um, there might just be that extra uh, ingredient about laughing with someone that's related to our better psychological health. 
So um, these were three examples of the importance of assessing automatic behaviors. Hopefully I was a little bit convincing there. The importance of assessing these behaviors in the coping context. Um, and they clearly show that they, these behaviors don't have this universal significance across context, that the social context really matters. Um, and so in my last study that I'm going to present to you, I'm going to dig a little bit deeper into the social context of coping. Um, and this time focus on uh, couples coping with breast cancer. So oftentimes we study people who are coping with something, let's say breast cancer, um, and we give them a questionnaire or uh, we study them in other ways, but oftentimes people have a partner or a spouse of some sort and they interact with each other. Um, and surely this might influence the coping process in some way. But it's not even just them, right? So people interact with friends and family, um, and those interactions certainly might matter for the coping process as well. So what we do is we um, use the ear to monitor these conversations, but if we stopped at patient monitoring, we would only get half of the picture here because the partner also might be very upset um, at the diagnosis of the cancer and, and the ongoing coping process that ensues. And so what we do is we uh, monitor both the patient and the partner, and then that way we use the couple as the unit in, in this kind of study. So to give you some background, this, this sort of um, coping context has often been called communal coping or relationship-focused coping. And this is the idea that stressors are often not an isolated experience and that they're shared with uh, a partner and with the larger social network. Um, and in the case of breast cancer, the diagnosis of, of the breast cancer um, is often traumatic for the partner as well. And they, in fact, there's some evidence showing that partners' uh, trajectories of psychological adjustment are linked throughout time as well. So the social cognitive processing model is a useful model that uh, developed primarily by Steve Lepore. Um, and it acknowledges that not only does the patient have to process the stressful experience, but that this process might be a social experience in and of itself. So people don't just sit and think all the time. They often interact with others and sort of process things in a social manner. Uh, and they talk about social constraints and how they might be barriers to um, someone engaging in this sort of social processing. So if I feel that I won't get a supportive response from someone or that someone doesn't want to hear me talk about a problem, then that's a social constraint and I might not disclose to them. So we wanted to explore this model in the context of naturalistically observed conversations um, and very broadly address the questions of how often, with whom, and how couples talk about cancer and how these conversations relate to both partners' adjustment. So for this study, we had 52 breast cancer patients who were on active treatment like chemotherapy or radiation, and their partners as well. And we, had, uh, we assessed psychological adjustment and had them wear the ear over one weekend, so this timeline should look a little bit familiar from the last one there. And we had them complete all sorts of uh, psychological adjustment measures, but today I'll be focusing on the impact of event scale, which assesses avoidance um, and in intrusive thoughts, and then the CESD again to measure depressive symptoms. So first of all, um, just to show you the reliability here of how well we can code um, with whom the person is talking and about what they are talking. Um, we had research assistants code for um, whether or not they were talking with their spouse or partner, um, and also whether or not they were talking about cancer. And we see for both, these are interclass uh, correlations that are fairly high. And we thought, okay, these people are coping with cancer, they're on active treatment, this is a very stressful experience. We thought, we're going to hear this in so many sound files, it's gonna be a very sort of heavy experience for our research assistants to listen to all of these sound files. But in fact, what we found is that patients spoke about cancer in 6.2% of their conversations, and spouses spoke about cancer in 2.5% of their conversations. So 
that in and of itself was a very surprising finding to us. Um, we definitely expected to hear more. Um, but it seems that in the first place, it's not intruding into their conversations um, as much as one might predict. And just to give you an example of what kinds of conversations these were when they were talking about cancer, we had Research Assistance Code for Disclosure, which was um, revealing anything emotional or personal about yourself. Um, and also another kind of conversation that frequently came up was informational uh, conversation. So very um, pragmatic, um, basic kinds of, of discussion of information about the cancer experience here. Um, and about a quarter of the, the cancer conversations were disclosure, whereas uh, about half of them were informational. And so to, of course, demonstrate this a little bit better to give you an idea of what they sounded like, I brought some examples here. So um, disclosure, and this one I think she is the breast cancer patient who is talking to uh, clients at work. I mean, there's definitely some crappy side effects, but you know what? It's fine. Not, you know, I don't care. Yeah, I mean, if, if it means that I will be done with this and hopefully it won't come back again, um, fine. So here she's talking about her treatment for breast cancer, so she's unhappy about the side effects, but she has a sort of hopeful outlook about it. And then the informational conversation that I have for you is um, a partner of a breast cancer patient, and she's discussing the credentials of an oncologist. She got online and checked her out, so we knew that she had had a fellowship at USF. Uh, so before I move on to the results of our links to adjustment, do anybody, are there any questions? Or? So to assess how these kinds of conversations relate to psychological adjustment outcomes, I use the after-partner interdependence model developed by Kenny and colleagues. Um, and this basically allows us to assess um, what we call after effects, so how your own predictor is related to your own outcome. And we can also assess um, how your own predictor is related to your partner's outcome. I label it spouse because of these models, even though they weren't all married, um, because a partner effect for a partner and patient gets very complicated, so I'll call them spouses. And the model also accounts for the fact that patients and spouses might be related on factors other than our, that the predictors actually are probably related because they live together, they chose to be together, and all sorts of factors there. But it also accounts for the fact that um, variables that aren't included in our model here might also be related, and so it controls for the interdependence of our participants here, and therefore uses the couple as the unit of analysis. So first I'm going to show you the results for um, disclosure about cancer on our outcome measure of, um, this was the impact of event scale. So. It's a measure of avoidance of cancer as a topic and intrusive thoughts about it. And this is change, um, so these are the residualized, the follow-up scores residualized for the time one scores. And what we find is that um, spouse's disclosure about cancer was related to fewer, uh, less avoidance and fewer intrusive thoughts among uh, patients. So this can be seen in sort of a positive light that the more spouses are willing to disclose about cancer to patients, um, the better off patients are psychologically. Megan? Yes. So this is always a spouse disclosing to the patient, so the patient is... Yes, in, I'm but, sorry. But is it a rural immunostasis? You know, yes, I forgot to mention that point that um, so many of the conversations were between spouses rather than with other friends and family that for these analyses we just focused on those couple conversations. So these were only conversations in which they were talking to each other. Thank you for that clarification. Any other questions here? Yeah. What would be an example of uh, 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 a statement of disclosure from the spouse about the cancer? Um, so the spouses get stressed about the experience too. So it could be anything about their own feelings about the cancer experience or perhaps even their concern for the patient. Um, I don't, although I do sometimes have quotes in my head from this study, I don't right now, but those would be some examples, generally. Okay. 
And so here we're looking at informational conversations, so those less emotional conversations. And the outcome here is depressive symptoms. And we find the same pathway is significant. So that spouse's informational conversations were related to uh, decreases in depressive symptoms among patients. So we're seeing this picture sort of emerge here that spouses' sub uh, substantive conversations um, are related to patients' better psychological adjustment, above and beyond how much patients are disclosing. Um, and uh, basically, we think that this lends some strong evidence uh, toward the social cognitive processing model that I mentioned, in that if the spouses are willing to discuss these more substantive topics about cancer with the patient, that that may be removing social constraints that the patient may otherwise feel about discussing the cancer and feeling like it's okay um, to express themselves about, uh, about this situation. However, I don't want to skim over the fact that the vast majority of conversations were not about cancer at all. Um, and so this, actually I forgot to mention in the beginning, this is newly in press um, at, in Journal of Family Psychology. Um, and that paper only focuses on the cancer conversations. We thought that it was important to dedicate the, the first paper to an examination of those conversations about cancer. But certainly I'm not going to ignore in future analyses um, the non-cancer conversations because it certainly, in my mind, cannot mean that they're not important um, just because they're not about cancer. And so um, I do plan to dedicate some future analyses to those. Um, and also I think that in the bigger picture of coping research, I think that more attention should be paid to non-cancer and also unemotional conversations. So half of their conversations, even when they were about cancer, were this more informational, less emotional uh, nature. Whereas a lot of in-lab studies that ask people to come into the lab and ask them to discuss these very um, emotional cancer-related topics, which are clearly important, um, as corroborated by my data as well, but certainly don't capture the larger picture um, as a whole on people's coping experience. So we certainly had limitations. You probably noticed that a common theme throughout my, my talk was that most of the samples were small and very white. Um, so all of these findings really do need to be replicated among larger samples and um, and more diverse ones as well. Also, this was cross-sectional aggregated data. So I mentioned earlier that it was dichotomous coding, so presence or absence of a behavior. And we averaged across all of the sound files to output that frequency of um, the behavior's occurrence. And so certainly, within-person longitudinal analyses are warranted here so that we can see in real time, if I swear, how does my partner respond? Um, and that would yield some very interesting, um, interesting data, I think. Um, another limitation that I found um, as I was analyzing this data is that I'm very interested in these variables that require a little bit more social context. Um, and so things like disclosure and support, um, if you want to examine how they co-occur, um, I think that in future studies, I would use longer sampling periods in order to capture and give us a chance to capture a little bit more of people's responses if, say, a participant discloses to someone. Um, and if you're interested in using this methodology in your own work, I'm happy to talk to you about sampling periods as well. And thank you very much um, to all my collaborators and to you for your attention. I want to turn briefly to the topic of depression because I think your data um, potentially are well positioned to test some interesting ideas. So if you hold aside depression that doesn't seem to have any precipitating event, and say, we're not going to talk about that right now, we're going to talk about depression of the kind that the participants in your study suffer with a clear precipitating event, um, then there are basically two classes of explanations for such depression. So one is, um, it is uh, a costly but inevitable consequence of something else that's going on. Okay, so mm -hmm. the body needs to do something in the face of this challenge. Right. And the things that the body has to do produce depression. As right, inflammation process. Yeah, right. So, so that 
Um, it's not actually necessarily functional, perhaps, but it's an inevitable. Okay? And then there's another class of explanations that say, no, actually, depression um, serves a function, that is, it is part of uh, a solution to a problem itself. And there are two general classes within that category, one where the function is intrapsychic and the other where it's interpersonal. Okay? So the intrapsychic is sort of, um, the function is to lead the person to reflect on the possibilities that they have before them now, to consider events that have led to the current circumstances, and take their time in making a decision. Another argument is that it is a communicative act, right? That is, that the depression itself is an attempt to change the behavior of the people around um, the depressed individual. Um, and that suggests that an analysis like the analysis that you did with swearing could be done for sighing, given the sure. correlation that you have for sighing and depression, right? Sure. And that it would be interesting to know, for example, whether people sigh more in the presence of someone else than in the absence of someone else. And in particular, the, these signaling explanations of depression predict that they ought to be sighing in the presence of the people who have the biggest stake in that person's welfare, in the depressed individual's welfare. Right? Yeah, so if you can identify, question. you know, say from your partner um, uh, here study, right, mm -hmm. if you go back to those data, so you, you can then cross correlate You say, well, we know who right. this person is. Right. right. Um, uh, you can test those hypotheses, and they haven't been well tested to date. I mean, people have tried, but the, the, the data that people typically use in, in exploring these stuff are all the limitations that you described at the beginning. Sure, sure. Thank you for that. I, I looked at those analyses, actually. I, hadn't, um, I haven't gotten to the full potential of the couple's data yet, so um, it's an exciting possibility. Thank you. I want to thank you for the, the talk. I think that the method is it's is very, very interesting. Thank you. Um, and I agree with you that stretching it out a little bit longer would be useful. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think you might be interested, um, uh, Linda Garo here and I were part of a, a big project looking at family life. And one of the other members of our team is Lena Rapetti, who's a clinical psychologist. And we um, videotaped um, families from like dawn to dusk. And we also collected cortisol samples four times a day for every member of the family. And um, we also took, uh, we also gave them the standard psychological measures of depression and marital satisfaction and neuroticism and a lot of other things. And Rena and her team developed a way of coding the videotape every 10 minutes. They took, I believe it was a 30 second slice of the videotape, but they had the advantage of this continuous stream right. of video to kind of understand what was going on, and of course they had the visual part there. But they developed, they took, it, was, it took them about two years, but they developed a very sophisticated scheme, I mean, a protocol for measuring emotion, negative emotion and positive emotion on scales and kinds, and also looking at intensity of emotion and they correlated a lot of um, the uh, parent-child and the couple interaction mm -hmm. with respect to the cortisol levels, I mean, what the cortisol levels were, were marking. And we, they also uh, collected subjective reports about the difficulties, if there were conflicts or hardships in, in the workplace, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, they, they have, th there is this arc of the day where they looked at it, it would be really interesting to, you know, I, I think it would be interesting to get you guys together to 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 look at the advantages of all these these difference. And the other thing is that um, the, at um, the London School of Economics, they're they're using something that is pretty similar to this, except it's on glasses, and it, it, they call it subjective evidence-based ethnography. And they, you know, it's part of like the big data things, like sure. you know, like wearing the, the thing on your wrist or having the, something that you wear on your chest, which flashes, you know, photographs every ten minutes. Mm -hmm. Anyway, they uh, use the the data, and they they go back to the person and have the person um, you listen, you know, listen and look at the the material, whatever the thing is, and then get their own 
enhance subjectivity about what was going on at that particular time and who mm -hmm. was around in space mm -hmm. and get more of the information that you can't get from the little teeny scene. But anyway, I yeah. think that it's, it's very exciting, the new kind of tools that are coming Absolutely. about these Absolutely. days um, that is transforming the way in which anthropologists can do ethnography mm -hmm. and, and social psychologists like yourself yeah. to be able to blend these things across disciplinary boundaries and to be able to get also computer scientists mm -hmm. or you know people to help us try to figure out how we can combine this kind of naturalistic and the you know something that does seem representative mm -hmm. absolutely I think um, I would be sort of a, a, a failure at science if after this study I said no let's just use the ear um, because so many more questions come out with you know, with every finding that you do have, you want to know a little bit more about, you know, what were they thinking at that time? What were they feeling? Um, you know, what was their heart rate or um, their cortisol level? So absolutely, um, I think it's a very important future direction that we not only combine all of the methods that I talked about, but all the ones that you just mentioned too, um, in vivo as well as sort of before and after the assessment. So I think it's, it's very important and I'd be happy to connect. I have a question about your uh, the last study that you presented. Okay. If you had specific hypotheses about why the informational discussions led to uh, from the spouses yeah. led to change in depressive symptoms, whereas the disclosure led to change in avoidance of intrusive thoughts, I assume that they didn't yeah. go the other way. They did not go the other way, um, which is a very good observation. Um, you know, I have to admit because. We did not hypothesize that difference in, in relationship to outcome measure. I think it's um, a limitation of this study because I can try to come up with an explanation after the fact, but I, I don't know that it's a meaningful distinction. I think that we were um, slightly underpowered to detect small effect sizes, and so um, I think that's more likely the reason that we found it with one outcome and not the other. Um, so. I think that's the explanation, honestly. Um, as far as, was the first part of the question about um, informational conversations in general, or was it really just the switch of the outcome measure? It was just sort of, is there, a, is there a theory as to why informational support from a spouse or informational yeah. conversations from a spouse would lead to a decrease in depressive symptoms, whereas Versus, the, yeah, emotional the emotional conversation leads to less avoidance or intrusive thoughts. My guess is that that's not a real difference in okay. the real world. I think that it, it was a, an inability of our study to detect a small effect size. And then my second uh -huh. follow-up question was, I was surprised to see that um, there was no direct effect of patient um, on patient change in terms yes. of their own discussion of disclosure or information. Um, and yeah. given the research, I on definitely predicted it. Yeah. <laughs> expressing emotion, especially with the disclosure one, I was mm -hmm. surprised. Expressing emotion in stressful context typically leads to a better psychological adjustment. Right. So, so I think, yeah, I do. So for that one, I think that it's it's a product of the context in which you're disclosing. So the actor partner models control for each pathway when they test one in particular, and so. Um, it's not that there was absolutely no relationship to one's own disclosure and their own outcome, but um, I think that it was more dependent on the fact that if, if I'm disclosing, my partner's also willing to disclose and engage in this conversation, um, whether informationally or emotionally. Does that answer? I think so. So, th so if the part if they're both sort of willing to disclose, mm -hmm. then part of that relationship gets yes. essentially partialed out. And so I should mention, I think actually our descriptive findings sort of lend some support to the notion because um, patients' levels of disclosure were significantly higher, more frequent mm -hmm. than that of the spouses. And so I think that for patients, it was almost a given that they were going to disclose at some point during the weekend, um, but. Spouses, it, it was definitely not the case. They disclosed much less frequently than the patients did. And so I think it's the case that it is. The, the partner's willingness to engage in these conversations, because they are happening, um, that really uh, is beneficial to the patient's well-being. Okay. Uh, 
Um, I have a couple of observations about this, the swearing study. Uh -huh. So, of course, words can uh, become, they were tabooed and they become untabooed, or they, they, were, they were tabooed and they become tabooed. And, and I noticed that the, the sample is mostly middle-aged or older people. Yes. I wonder if you get the same thing with, with, with uh, a, a younger population. Um, I, I wonder the same thing. <laughs> so, um, actually, we discussed this in, in the uh, paper at the very end of it, where, yeah, we were thinking about that, and we thought, you know, these are, it's not a stereotypical behavior for middle-aged women to be swearing. So, um, we actually, I don't think that this will hold for men or for younger samples. Um, I do think that there's probably something to the notion that it's a counter-stereotypical behavior, and that perhaps is a little, if it is repelling people, that that would be one of the active ingredients, um, and that you don't expect it, or perhaps you don't condone it among that demographic. Um, it, it does seem to be that... I do plan to test it among the partners in my, in my breast cancer sample. There's a kind of semantic inflation can go on where, you know, the more a person mm -hmm. swears just at a baseline level, then, mm -hmm. you know, it, um, that, that car horn effect starts to diminish. And people just sure, it's not as alarming. Yeah. yeah. In this sample, we didn't see that happen. So the data in this sample don't support that, but certainly there probably is a higher upper limit to be had for swearing than the sample that we had. So um, the range was pretty high, but most people were not at that upper end of the range of swearing. So, um, in fact, we ended up transforming our, our data before we conducted the analyses to uh, account for that. Thanks. Uh -huh. Thank you. Yeah. So just another way of tackling that, I mean, you, presumably most of your, your pairs and your partner study are heterosexual, so the, the, the partners don't consequent, constitute adequate controls there. But if you had mm -hmm. either from you or I, Colleagues who are also using the same technology. Mm -hmm. If you have, you know, approximate age slash SDS match um, controls, then you can look at the frequency. So, I mean, it's a yeah. perfectly reasonable folk hypothesis that your participants are from a social class that doesn't swear very often, and so right. then the swear words are meaningful. But that's a testable Absolutely. explanation. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I definitely, this was, that was one of my favorite projects, really. It was just kind of fun to work on. So, um, <laughs> it was, you know, and oddly enough, it gets more attention than sighing. <laughs> so, um, I wasn't surprised. But, um, yeah, I, I do plan to dig a little bit deeper into, um, into swearing and its implications in a coping context. And, um, you know, the, my first instinct is to go to the data that I already have, and so I, I first plan to look at it among the men in the breast cancer sample, but certainly it's not an adequate control. You probably swear at more similar rates to your partner. So, um, but I figured start there and then um, start to look at other samples as well. Yep. Do you know if swearing is a feature of all cultures? Or is it? So I don't know that to be an absolute fact, but when I was reviewing um, Timothy Jay's work on swearing, he seemed to have some, some pretty good evidence that it is fairly ubiquitous. Um, but I, I can't say that I myself have looked into that extensively. Yeah. So the thing that I always come away with with the ear work is mm -hmm. the sort of power of the infrequent events. So you mm -hmm. know, like swearing, the sign, it doesn't happen all that much. Right. But it's sort of striking that you can see this sort of magnitude of associations, especially when you consider, like, it's not a very big slice of life because it's right. only one day or two days, right? Right. These two and a half yeah. days or so, yeah. it's one weekend. Uh -huh. So you alluded to this at the end about, like, you know, these are sort of the infrequent things, and there's all this more yes. common, ubiquitous stuff. And I don't, I'm, I'm wondering if you have a sense from what you've been listening to, mm -hmm. like, what might, what do you think might emerge from the more common things that we yeah. do? I think, well, one thing I would hope to find, we'll see uh, what the data show, but I would hope to find that the quality of the non-cancer interactions would really matter for someone's well-being. Um, Matthias's, Matthias Mel's past work um, finds that people who engage in more substantive conversations versus more superficial ones tend to be happier. Um, so I would hope to replicate that finding among a breast cancer sample. Um, but yeah, I, basic general quality, I think so, and there's many things we can pull out of that. So I, um, I encoded support 
and disclosure in the non-cancer conversations as well. So I would think that that would matter, especially if you're disclosing in a supportive context. You know, a, a lot of what I learned from listening to the sound files is um, that people are worried about other things too. I mean, it's really not that the cancer is consuming their conversations, um, but it's not that life is just a happy picnic for them. I mean, they have to decide who's going to make dinner and take kids to soccer practice if they're if they have children or. Um, you know, sometimes they're dealing with, you know, other family issues or, or something like that. And, and you need to be able to talk about those things, too. So I'm, I'm hoping that the, that sort of intimacy process pans out in the rest of the conversation. I wonder if you divided the sample and that your, your sample sort of skewed a little older, but if you had mm -hmm. some younger um, cancer patients in the sample. There were a couple of them. Kids and stuff, whether yeah. In a way, well, there were a lot that had, maybe like half even. Okay. Kids, yeah. I'm just wondering if something like that, that as you say, can consume a lot of, of your time, if mm -hmm. that um, changes the percentage of conversations that are about cancer, because if you've got these other needs that need to be met, whether it's a partner or children right. or a job, what kind of job they have, things like that, that um, and then that, that then in turn would affect rates of, of depression. Um, I, I mean, yeah. it may already be sort of like an age-related um, risk for depression. Right. You know, cancer, I don't know. But, um, right. So age is typically, in the literature, um, typically predicts worse adjustment among cancer patients because as you, when you're younger, you don't, but the idea is that you don't really expect it. It's not something that, you know, as you age, you sort of expect that if you live to be a certain age, medical problems start arising. But for young people, that's not the case. So um, so typically, age is negatively associated with adjustment. But in this case, you, you might be right. You might be having that sort of protective effect of a little bit more going on. If you're not retired and you don't have kids at home, or and you do have kids at home. I was, was thinking the opposite, actually. Oh, really? I was thinking that controlling for the already um, effects of, of age, which it makes sense to me mm -hmm. you, you say that that falls out, that the fact that you don't have these other things consuming your time means you have more time to think about the cancer and may, in fact, make you maybe better informed, but also maybe more likely to be depressed and things like that, because you sort of if you're forced to go about your day mm -hmm. in a, in a, in a quote-unquote normal way because you have to pick up your kids. And right. Like that, you're not able to act. In the context of sure. your daily life. Sure. And you're not able to act depressed, right? So if you have kids, I mean, you, you can in some cases, but, um, yeah, if you have kids that have needs, generally people have to attend to them somehow. Yeah. Well, in the, were there? Personality measures in that in the last study? Uh, there were, but I did not include them. Because one, you could actually imagine that uh, <clears throat> you could get even more predictive power out of your model if you included mm -hmm. it. Because maybe for like for people who are highly neurotic, it actually would do them harm to talk about the, to make them feel worse to talk sure. about the cancer. Sure. Because the things they would say would. So. Absolutely, and and probably um, people who are more extroverted maybe were talking about it a little bit more. Or it's, it's possible that, yeah, personality could be influencing uh, some of those processes. It just, I guess, picking up on what Ted said earlier, if you, if you think about it, um, so your, your sort of dichotomous, um, or binary, rather, mm -hmm. um, coding, uh, that, that there is an effect of these rare events is, is in itself impressive, but it's even more impressive if you think about that probably a lot of those conversations about the cancer, for example, mm -hmm. um, are actually mundane. So, the, yeah. I mean, the reality of the treatment is that it's, it's intrusive in the individual's daily routine, yep. and so they have to make a lot of adjustments, and often they're going to be talking to their partner about the adjustments, just because they're things you got to do, right? So, you know, pick the, up the the, prescription. who's going to, right, yeah. I have to go to treatment, so you have to pick up the kids from sure. school or whatever it is, sure. right? So that's a conversation about cancer, but it's not the kind of conversation about cancer that we think about in the health psychology right. literature about disclosure of inner sentiments and all the rest of it. Right. It's just, there's this thing going on. It's like, well, the, you know, if you, you, you could, you know, analogize, analogize it to, you know, somebody who has, you know, mechanical problems with their car, right? And mm -hmm. the car is unreliable. Well, they're going to be talking about the car a lot of the right. time because right. that's just going to be impinging on their daily habits. 
Yeah, so we did also code for practical conversations as well, so <coughs> for brevity I didn't include them, but, um, but yeah, a lot of the conversations were just, you know, how driving to the, the treatment appointment or picking up a prescription or um, some sort of necessary practical function that resulted from having cancer. I mean, in, I, often I think people disclose their cancer for simply that reason, right? That, so it's not necessarily that they're trying to elicit support from others. It's mm -hmm. that I need to explain to you why things right. are going to be different. Right. right, so that's why we define our disclosure as, a, it was sort of the bar was a little bit higher for emotional disclosure and that there had to be some sort of emotional or very personal component to it because of all these instances where people just need to tell you something to get something done.